Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and recently we refuted the claims that the assumption dogma is ambiguously defined, and that Jesus contradicted the assumption of Mary while talking to Nicodemus. This time, we'll look at the other arguments against the assumption which have been proposed to see how they fare. Firstly, it's sometimes proposed that the assumption of Mary contradicts the words of St. Paul, who said, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise again incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-two. However, there's no explicit contradiction between this verse and the assumption of Mary. Those who argue against the assumption using this verse would say that if Mary was assumed, then she can't rise and be changed with the rest of the dead, and this verse therefore can't be right. However, it doesn't say that everyone who has died will rise again, or else Jesus would need to be among them. So clearly, people who have already been resurrected aren't being referred to in this verse. But suppose that Mary hasn't been raised from the dead as such, only assumed. Well, in that case, there's nothing to stop her from rising again from the dead with the other dead people. The doctrine of the assumption of Mary is unrelated to the question of whether or not Mary has been resurrected yet. The two other major arguments against this teaching are similar to each other. First is the fact that the Bible contains descriptions of other assumptions, like those of Enoch and Elijah, but not of the assumption of Mary and secondly, that the assumption of Mary should have happened within the time the books of the New Testament were being written, and therefore it should have been mentioned. These two arguments are both arguments from silence, and therefore guilty of the same logical fallacy. In other words, they try to support a claim by guessing about what's meant by the fact that a writer didn't choose to include a certain event in their writings. That's a bad way to reason. Not only that, but they rest on comparing two different books of the Bible for consistency, and that's not a good way to do a historical study. The books of the Bible weren't all written by the same author, or even in the same genre, so comparing them for clues about what a particular author's silence means isn't a good way to go about this. However, there is one more thing to say about each of these arguments. First, that while brief, short descriptions of the assumptions of Enoch and Elijah are included in separate books of the Old Testament, we have every reason to think that there were other assumptions which were not described in any book of the Bible. The assumption of Moses is mentioned briefly in the book of Jude, but it's never actually described anywhere in the Bible. When Michael the archangel, disputing with the devil, contended about the body of Moses, he durst not bring against him the judgment of railing speech, but said, the Lord command thee. Jude, verse 9. The Old Testament never described the assumption of Moses. It just said no one knew where his tomb was, so this would be an example of how not every assumption is described. As for the time when Mary was assumed, we don't know exactly when it took place. It's possible that when Mary was assumed, most of the New Testament had been written already, and Jude, James, or John are unlikely to mention Mary's assumption into heaven in letters that are supposed to be about how to conduct yourself as part of the church. That having been said, however, John does include a curious passage in the book of Revelation. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation 12, 1. John describes Mary as a great and glorious figure in heaven, with the moon itself under her feet. Is this a veiled reference to Mary having been assumed by this point? I don't know. Still, I think it would be too much to suggest that it couldn't be. So, in the end, none of the arguments against the assumption of Mary really work all that well, or are particularly strong, and most have multiple problems that arise from fallacies, misconceptions, and misinterpretations of the Bible. Next time... What is Theotokos? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.